out of favor. Hallelujah. Woo, hallelujah. Isn't Amen. the Lord good? Bless his name. Amen. Amen. The better we know him, the better off we are. Amen. In our daily experience. Yes, hallelujah. hallelujah. God bless you and the heavens smile on you. Yes, Lord. We're on a mission to get it said and to get it done. We don't have time to vacate. <laughs> we, every once in a while, he say, come aside and rest. That's because as the disciples, they couldn't even eat. They were so bombarded. So we don't have time to be just hanging out. We have work to do. And blessed is that servant who was so found doing when his Lord returned. Not getting ready to do, but doing it. That's what we really want. Amen. To be found doing. Amen, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen, Lord. Well, let me uh, get to have Brother James Thomas in prayer with us this morning. Amen. Amen. I haven't seen him in a good while. But it's, it's, it's a good thing to have the Lord orchestrate our way and day of, in such a way that we can meet daily with the saints. Not everyone is in that position to do so. And then those of us who are in a position to do so and do not, um, well, there's a price to pay for not doing it the Bible way. In the scriptures, they met daily in the temple and from house to house. Every day, seven days a week. I want to just speak a little bit about why it is that many of us experience from day to day the things that we do don't know that we bring it all on ourselves. All right. We bring the good, we bring the bad, and we bring the ugly right. on ourselves. And we don't know that that's what's going on. <laughs> and we need someone to help us to connect the dots so that we can see the big picture of what's really going on in our personal lives. Um, in Matthew's Gospel, Chapter 7, in verses 1 and 2, Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, Jesus says, Judge not that ye be not judged. Now, verse 2 is the key. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, I'll get to that, it shall be measured to you again. He says, whatever conclusion you come to as to what is warranted in someone else's life as a result of their deficiencies or their inadequacies or their sins or whatever the case may be, whatever we conclude that ought to happen to them is going to happen to us. And to the degree that we think it ought to happen to someone else, to that same degree is going to happen to us. So, again, we want to conclude that the word judge or judgment has more than one meaning. Uh, in my book that I wrote 40 years ago on strong words about deception, 
I deal with the three types of judges, judgments. It's crino, anacrino, and diacrino. That means to discern or to investigate or to assign punishment. Now, we're to investigate and we are to discern, but we're not to consign the punishment. Now, we can conclude that somebody is wrong and there are consequences to being wrong, but we're not to decide what the consequences ought to be. Because as soon as we decide what the consequences ought to be, then whenever we fall into the category of the same, and Paul says, those that judge another do the same thing. So thou art inexcusable, O man, that judgeth. In other words, it takes one to know one in the first place. So that if we're not spiritual, we've not been delivered from the thing that we're discerning in others. And so the scripture said, if you see a man overtaken with a fault, ye that are spiritual go to such a one and restore him considering yourself, lest ye also be tempted. In other words, you've been there, done that, got the t-shirt for it. Now you discern that in somebody else. And the question is, am I spiritual enough to help him? If I'm not spiritual enough to help him, what I'm going to do, I'm going to decide that they're wrong because I know wrong when I see wrong because I'm wrong. And then I'm going to step over the line and conclude what ought to be the mandate or the punishment for that activity. Right. And even though I may not be doing it physically, it's in my heart because it takes my heart to know it when I see it. And so God deals with my heart and sometimes in my body parts. Because we are thinking the same thing ought to happen to somebody else. The Lord ought to knock his head off. The Lord ought to knock him in onto his sick bed. Something ought to happen to his family. That woman ought to leave him. That man ought to slap him, slap her. All these things that come up in our minds and we don't know that the word of God is judging our very thoughts and intents of the heart and we're not doing anything about it, it ends up boomeranging on us and we're actually experiencing the very thing that we're thinking about others and don't even know it. <laughs> this is why the scripture says gird up the loins of your mind and be sober. That's why the scripture says though we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down Amen. of strongholds, casting down of imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity what? Every thought to the obedience of Christ. God judges us on our thinking and then our speech and then our actions. And get this, he knows our thoughts are far off. He knows what we're going to be thinking next year this time. All right. And he's already, according to the principles that he's already laid out in the universe and in earth, in our practical lives, he's already laid out the consequences of our thinking a year from now. Isn't that something? They say, well, I don't think so. Well, we don't know God. <laughs> God is greater than our thoughts. Amen. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Amen. His ways are higher than our ways. We're, we're talking about the one who created the whole universe. Amen. We're talking about the one who raised the dead. Ooh, glory to God. We're talking about the one that kicked the devil out of heaven. He is somebody. But then he's our father. And judgment begins the house of God. So, we want to get the monkey off our back and for some the gorilla All right. we need to get the gorilla off our back and start shooting our own self in our own feet All right. and blaming somebody else no you got the smoking gun right there <laughs> you mean to shoot somebody else and you shot yourself but then realize you're doing your own self the harm like the scripture says 
Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God and a root of bitterness springing up and, there, and trouble you and thereby many be defiled. In other words, we can be in such bad shape that people hang around us are in trouble. Just for being close to us. Because we're living in bitterness and unforgiveness. And we defile people even when we breathe on them or shake their hands. <laughs> well, get off yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. So, uh, the, the apostle says to us, and he gives us a good lesson. Over in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 5, he, he gives us a good lesson. He's talking about the difference between a believer and an unbeliever. A saved person who's in the body of Christ versus a person that's not born again, not saved, not in the body of Christ. And they both have to be judged, but the judgment comes from different directions. And when you read that whole chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, you discover that if a person is a believer, is a person, it's a Christian then it's up to Christians to judge them. That is, to discern and investigate their situation and with proper authority and in the spirit of Christ determine the outcome. Now this man who has sex with his father's wife, his stepmother, and Paul says, I've already concluded, judge the matter. And when you get together with the spirit of Christ and my spirit, you deliver such a one over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. In other words, he needs to die an early death. Because he's doing the kind of stuff that Gentiles don't even talk about. That sinners don't even discuss in public. But yet you know it and you've not done anything about it. And you're puffed up thinking everything is okay. No, it's not okay. You've been defiled. There's leaven in your camp, in the body, in the believers, in the fellowship, and you gotta take the leaven out because it has affected the whole loaf. Kick the person out. Put them out. <laughs> and then don't pray for him, but deliver him to the devil so the devil can kill him. And some people think that's very harsh, but that's, no, that's apostolic. That's Christology. That's body life. When a person is living such a low down, bad life, and then, you know, you got some believers say all sin is sin. No big sin, no little sin. That's an expression of spiritual ignorance. There's a sin that's not unto death, and there's a sin that is unto death. And if the sin is not unto death, the scripture says in 1 John, pray for it and God will give him life. But the sin is unto death. I do not say that you should pray for it. In other words, there are some people who are sinning in such a way you don't even pray for their deliverance. You let them go on and die. They need to get out the way. They're a problem to not only the church, but they're a problem to the world. They are an obstruction to other people getting saved. You say, well, what, that, what does that look like? i tell you what it looks like. It looks like somebody had been in church life for 20, 30, 40 years and still on crack. That's what it looks like. It looks like the preacher that preaches and get the money and go get a hit. That's what that looks like. And the saints don't know what to do about it. It looks like the preacher that's having uh, uh, rendezvous with the young fellows in the congregation and the people don't know what to do about it because they're so enamored with the mega congregation. They don't know they ought to deliver that pastor over to death and get him out the way. And I had to prophesy on at least one. I said, there ain't no way that this person's coming back. That person's going to die. And everybody's going to see him die. 
There's no recovery for him. Now it took five years before he shriveled up like a prune and died, but he died before the whole world. Because I saw what he did. How it adversely affected the whole body all over the world. So the apostle is saying in chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, he says, now, if it's a brother, deal with him. If he's not a brother, let him alone. God will take care of him. You see. It ain't about the devil killing him. It's about God dealing with him. Those that are not without on the outside, God judges. So Paul said, what have I to do with those? So when I, when I see people on Facebook judging the president, I ask myself two questions. Do the person believe that the president is a heathen and a crazy person, not born again, not a Christian? Well, if that be the judgment, then the person has no business judging him publicly. Because if they judge him publicly and say he's not worthy of being the president, then it'll boomerang back on that person and they don't even know they're not worthy of being a husband and a father and a grandfather and a provider or the president of their family. And then they'll contract some physical disease and become unable to function as a father, a grandfather, or provider, or so forth, because they judge the president, get this, as an unbeliever, and he's being publicly judged. And people don't, they, they, they don't know that. They don't know those principles. They're not taught very well in the scriptures. And if they conclude, get this, that the president is a believer, but he's a bad act, he's a bad actor. He's a bad Christian actor. Talking crazy and all this kind of stuff. Well, if that be the case, the church ought to judge it. But the scripture, it says here, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 11, But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man is called a brother, be a fornicator or covetous or idolater, railer, drunkard, or extortioner is such a one not to eat. Now, um, now that's that's what we should that's what we should do. That's how we respond. We make sure we're not fellowshipping believers that are bad actors. We just don't, we don't even have a hamburger with them. All right, yeah. And there's another place that says, but don't treat him like a heathen. Don't treat him like a heathen. You treat him like a brother by separating yourself so that he would be what? A shame. You see? Because the spirit bear witness in our spirit that we are sons or children of God. Amen. And if a child of God separates him or herself from me, I'm a true believer, I'm going to feel some kind of way about it. If I'm not a believer, it won't make any difference. So we have to know how to play the role in terms of discerning, investigating, judging, uh, consigning the outcome of a person's bad doings. And when we conclude as believers, not only to be separated, but this person needs to be turned over to the devil, you don't do it by yourself. It's the church's business. It's with apostolic authority. And the reason why it doesn't happen much, because people don't believe apostles are present today. And those that call themselves apostles, they're clowns for the most part. Not real true apostles, they're clowns. Dress up in clown clothes. With long fingernails and and skinny jeans and long wigs and and the kind of suits that 
What you got to wear a zoot suit for? Long chains. Looking silly. It's not an apostle. That's an, that's an imposter. <laughs> and it makes it bad for the real true apostles that are far and in between. And the main ingredients of a real true apostle, the first thing is what? Endurance. Endurance. They can last and last and last and last and last under all the conditions. Acts chapter 8, great persecution against the church. And everybody is scattered except the apostles. True apostolic ministry means nobody can run you out of town. When Paul was drug out of the city and stoned and left for dead, he's an apostle. He got back up and went right back into the city. Amen. Isn't God good? He's good. <laughs> so, we have to think about what we're thinking about. We have to really uh, investigate what we're talking about and who we're talking about. And then watch our actions as a result of our thinking. Because it's going to come back like a uh, chicken on the nest. Going to settle in. And uh, again in Galatians, ye that are spiritual, go to such a one. It says there, right there in chapter 6, if a man is overtaken with in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. In the spirit of meekness. And why in the spirit of meekness? Knowing that we've been delivered ourselves. That's the only way we know the guy was in trouble or the girl was in trouble. Not that we necessarily did it, but the potential of doing it is in the flesh. And when we recognize by discernment good and evil, and we want to go deal with the evil, we got to be spiritual. Amen. Amen. And then the spirit of meekness means, now in meekness, we, got enough, we have enough grace to deal with it. Amen. Otherwise, it won't be any grace there, and we want to get in somebody's face. All right. And we get in somebody's face with no grace, We're going to say something or do something that's going to boomerang right back on our own experience. This is why, you know, early on in, in the ministry, you know, I was trying to help everybody that possibly came my way. You yeah, know, I just try to help folks. But now I look real hard now. Who are you? You know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Okay, you do. Okay, now, all right, now. Now we can talk about why you're in the problems you're in. Mm -hmm. So I got to teach you out of your bondage. Somebody that don't know Christ, I, the power of God has to deliver you out of your bondage. You need a miracle. No, but if you know Christ and you've been in sloppy, agape, and greasy grace, you need some teaching. I need some teaching. Is that what, let me close with that. that, that that's, that's what the, the scripture says. That, let's look at that. It, it says right there in, um, uh, uh -huh. in 2 Timothy, right there, chapter 2. 2 Timothy, chapter 2. It says, beginning with verse 24, 2 Timothy 2, 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. In other words, don't get in the folk face and start arguing. But be gentle unto all men. That's where the meekness come in. Apt 
to what? Teach. Teach and do what? Patient. Be patient. Be apostolic about your dealings with folks. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. In other words, they don't need the, the power to deliver them out of their situation because if they're born again and, you, and, and the power of God come upon them and, they, and they're, they're delivered out of their situation, they'll go right back to it. Go right back to it because of their ignorance. He says, in meekness, instructing those who oppo that oppose themselves. They're their own worst enemies. All right. They're their own problems. All right. They've done some things like judging somebody, and now they're under the same judgment, and they don't even know it. So they have to be taught out. <laughs> Instructing those that oppose themselves, if God, pre-adventure, will give them repentance. You see. That, that's, what, that's, that's for the believer. Because a believer in, that intentionally sins in mind, word, and actions, it's, they can't repent just because they need to. God got to give them the ability to. And, uh, and I know the Lord, I, I've experienced it in my, own, in my own experience. That certain things the Lord won't let us repent from until he judges for it. Because right. if we repent and, and opt for the mercy, yeah. then mercy rejoices against judgment. And God has to take his hand off us in terms of judgment. But no, he want to whoop some folk behind. So they can learn a lesson and gain a blessing. Amen. So he don't allow them to repent. He want to take them all the way down to the belly button. All right. And that, that's why I learned not to, to touch everybody. Don't touch everybody. Unless you get your hand hit. Because right. God is dealing with them. And they got to be taught out, not bought out. Taught out. All right. all right. And when people don't want to be taught. And, and I know people that don't want to be taught because when you start sharing with them, they always got as much to say as you do. It's tit for tat. They want the last word. No, I let the Lord deal with them. And when they get low enough that I can go on in, you know, go on down in there. Because they can't come up and they know it. If God preventive will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. As soon as we touch down on the truth, deliverance is coming right there. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Right there. But there are some people who are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? Because it takes the power of God to come to the knowledge of the truth because truth is making a person free. Amen. And people need to learn not to blaspheme. Learn. learn not to talk smack about who we don't even know. We got to learn not to judge in the wrong way. We got to learn how to do that. So watch who you talk about. And watch who you talk to. Ooh, glory to God. Oh, if we could have all day. Yeah, watch that. That's why you have to teach your children to obey. Otherwise, in their mind, they won't be obedient. And then pretty soon in their speech and then their actions. And then their lives are cut short and they don't even know it. I look at some young folk, I say, that person's not going to have gray hair. If, it, if he ever has, it'll be premature. Because they're not going to live out their days. Ain't no way. Ain't no God, if you please. If that person live out his days. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sow, that shall he also reap.
in that last verse, verse 26, and that they may recover themselves. You see that? They may discover, they're a part of their own deliverance. That they may dis, uh, recover themselves from the snare of the devil that have taken them captive at his will. I listen to people. I listen to the community. I listen to what they say and don't say and the spirit behind what they do say to determine what I will or will not say or will or will not do. Anybody else in the school of Christ with me? Amen. In the school of Christ. Amen. We learn lessons and gain blessings. Amen. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen today. Ooh-wee. 